Um, so a bit about me. My name is uh, Alfredo Reichlin. I'm a second year PhD student at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH in Sweden. I'm supervised by Professor Danika Kradzik, and I mainly work on uh, data-driven robotics, so offline reinforcement learning and imitation learning, and meta-learning in general as a way to speed up the learning process. So today I'm going to talk about this, uh, this paper that we submitted with my, my colleagues, and I'm going to talk more specifically about a model that we propose that helps the agent learned through a data set to avoid out of distribution states. So, so whenever you work with robots and especially robots that have learned the policy through, through data, you can often encounter this kind of problem that you can see here in the video of the robot trying to pick up the orange object, but all of a sudden drifting apart and wandering into the unknown without any possibility of recovering. Um, this is a big problem that most people that work in this field know and try to study and try to avoid, and it's called the out of distribution problem. And, and today I'm gonna try to explain a method to recover or at least robustify the kind of policies uh, to avoid this situation. So throughout this talk, I would assume that um, we have access to some data and specifically data that represents uh, uh, the state of a system and actions of uh, some other policy that has collected some trajectories. And what we want to do is want to distill the, the knowledge in this data in order to uh, approximate an optimal policy to solve particular tasks. Um, more formally, I, I'll assume a Markov decision process uh, uh, formulation where we assume the environment to be fully observable and finite in time. Uh, this MDP can be defined uh, completely with the tuple of a state space an action space and a transition function given by the environment. In particular, for this kind of problem, uh, I'm assuming the state to be uh, images, very dimensional RGB images, uh, actions to be translations of the gripper of a manipulator robot, so 3D Euclidean translations. And I'll assume that there exists a trans uh, tra transition functions that map states and actions to new states in the pixel space. So I assume this transition function in general to be very complex. Uh, this kind of formulation um, that I assume is because the experiments that we conducted for this paper are particularly oriented towards a manipulation perspective, but a more general formulation can still be applied. So in general, when you want to learn a policy, what you do is you parameterize a map P or pi from state to actions, uh, and we define a cost function. And then the problem, independently on the method that you use, can be formulated in general as finding the best parameters of this mapping in order to minimize some cost function j, where the definition of a cost function is very general and depends on the methods that you want to apply. Um, but I want to take it a step further. And I wanna to assume to not have access to the environment in which the robot or the agent needs to perform. Um, this is a particularly sensible assumption in the case of robotics where having access to the environment is not always trivial and can be dangerous and expensive. Moving a robot in the real world uh, can harm the, the people around them or can damage the robot and is in general very slow and very, very inefficient. Um, this, however, opens up a number of problems when learning a policy completely offline. Um, but the upside is that in case we manage to succeed and learn a policy optimally just from, from offline data, 
what would what we'd uh, expect from from this is the kind of the same kind of revolution that for example big data set as imagenet adds on computer vision where everything can be done fully offline and you don't need any kind of special equipment and you can just train your models and and that's the kind of revolution that this big data set has sparked throughout uh, the, the standard machine learning fields. So in order to learn a policy fully offline, there are two families, basically. Uh, the first one is imitation learning. So if we go back to the first definition of how to learn a policy in the previous slides, imitation learning assumes here that the cost J can be formulated through a supervised learning loss. And more specifically, we assume to have access to an optimal strategy, to an optimal uh, agent. And what we want to do is we want the policy pi given some states sampled from the data set to resemble as much as possible the ones of an optimal trajectory. Uh, this has in turn the advantage of not requiring the definition of uh, a reward function, which is not always uh, easy to, to have access to or to assume. Um, and it's pretty easy to train because it has all the benefits of supervised learning. On the other hand, it suffers from a number of problems among which the compounding error is the most pressing. And I'm gonna talk a bit, bit more about this, uh, this later. The second family of functions are called offline reinforcement learning and formulate the problem through a reinforcement learning perspective. So here the cost function is the maximization of the reward or the minimization of a negative reward. Uh, this doesn't really require a data set of optimal trajectories because um, the, the model itself comes up to the how to, to combine these all information into an optimal strategy it just requires a reward function. But on the other end, it requires a reward function. So we need to assume to have access to this. Um, generally, it has higher performances, but it's more difficult to train uh, because it's, it, it makes use of the data set in a less efficient way without looking at the actions that uh, um, the ones that recorded the data had, uh, took. Uh, but it's less biased than the imitation learning method. So it has higher performances. By the way, if you, if you guys have any questions, just stop me anytime, uh, feel free to, to ask me. So independently on the family of methods that you use to learn an offline um, policy uh, uh, strategy, mo in most cases you suffer from what I was referring at the, uh, the beginning of the talk, which is called the out of distribution problem. Uh, out of distribution basically means that uh, the agent could step into states that don't belong to the training data sets, to the training distribution. And this is a particularly problematic um, uh, situation, especially for, for an agent, for a decision-making agent, because once you step OOD, you have no way of recovering. And uh, what you end up with is the same situation of the, of the video that I showed in the first slide. Uh, because once OOD, you start behaving randomly and you have no notion on how to recover. And if you don't know how to recover, you're lost forever. So in this talk, I'll try to present an idea on how to robustify against this problem independently on the method used. So to be a bit more specific, what happens is what is called the compounding error, which is what I was referring in the beginning. Compounding error um, is, is a particular problem for any kind of, uh, any kind of problem that tries to, to solve a sequential decision-making uh, um, problem, which means that the actions that you need to take depends on states that you reached because of actions you took before. So what happens is that if you have a small error into your approximator or into your, into your policy, this error, every time you take an action, compounds and accumulates over time, and it makes you diverge from, from the original optimal policy. 
Um, and this can be seen uh, depicted in the, in the picture here. And once you diverge too much, then you end up OD and you don't know how to recover because you have in your data set no data on how to recover from such states. Uh, a bit of related work. So of course the OD problem um, for sequ uh, the se um, sequential decision-making problems has been already thoroughly studied. Uh, is not, not a recent problem, but most methods make assumptions that we want to try to avoid in this, uh, in this um, uh, paper. So the families of, of imitation learning models all tackle this problem by breaking the fully offline assumption. Uh, and what they do specifically is they, they teach a policy how to behave rather optimally, and then they deploy this policy into the real world um, as, as less as possible, but they still deploy it. And they challenge what they've learned into the real world and see where it diverges. And where it diverges, they collect more data and they continue the training. Uh, this has the advantage of learning most of the stuff offline and require minimal intervention in the, in the environment, but it still breaks the fully offline assumption. Uh, on the other end, offline reinforcement learning methods are a bit smarter in some way to this, uh, to this sense because they, they don't assume access to the environment whatsoever. But to solve this, they either rely into constraining or um, constraining the policy that they've learned too much by forcing the learned policy to stay as close as possible to the ideal policy that collected the data, also called the behavioral policy, um, constraining the effectiveness of this, of the learned policy, or they force the, the policy to avoid all the actions and the states that, that lie on the boundary of the training data set. Um, and in both cases, this constraining has a pretty negative effect on the overall policy because it makes the, the learned policy in general suboptimal and it's quite difficult to tune because if you tune it too much, it becomes too suboptimal. If you tune it not enough, you still go out of distribution because it's more of an incentivized version of, uh, of staying in distribution. What we want to do is, by the way, what we, want to, we want to not just avoid out of distribution, but finding a way to go back in distribution. So this is the, the model that we propose. Is, um, it relies on the assumption that, quite sensible assumption, that everything that is out of distribution should be regarded as dangerous. Um, this is, of course, not always true, but because we have no data about what happens outside of the distribution, we need to regard as dangerous. And by dangerous, I mean that it needs to be escaped as fast as possible whenever you step OD. So the model we, we propose is uh, composed of uh, three elements. Uh, is composed of uh, a learned policy, which can be learned through any of the previously explained methods. So imitation learning or offline RL, doesn't really matter. And I refer to this policy by the standard pi here. Uh, I want to couple this pi with the second policy, which I call the recovery policy, pi r. And I want to couple them in a soft way uh, by taking a, a, a weighted average of the two and weighted by a probability of the current state being in distribution or not. Um, this soft combination is needed because I don't want the two, the two policies to challenge each other in, uh, in um, a deterministic way and, and avoiding loops of them bringing the agent into the relative positions, but rather I want for them to make uh, a common decision on where to go. So of course, scaled by how pressing it is to recover or not, given by this P of S. So the first component is understanding whenever you step out of distribution. Uh, so probability of S being in the training data set or not. 
Um, we propose to compute this through the use of a density estimation technique, and in particular, what is called the density mixer model. This works uh, in the following way. So you take all the states of your, of your data set and you input them into a model which can be parameterized as a neural network. And this outputs a mixer of Gaussians. So a series of uh, means and uh, variances and optionally also some scale parameters alpha. And now you train this model in order to maximize the probability of all the data into uh, your um, distribution. Uh, this can in turn be used to estimate the density of new states that in our case, as I said before, are images. So you just take a new image, you input it into, into the DMM and you output a, a, your Gaussian mixer model and then you can compute the density of this current state into the, the Gaussian mixer model. Um, of course, the density is always positive, but it's not necessarily bounded to be between zero and one that we need because we need to estimate the probability. So we can just apply a squashing function in this case, a sigmoid function to scale it back between zero and, and one. Second component is the recovery policy. So the recovery policy is based on the following observation. What does it mean to recover from an OD state? Well, locally, it means to move the agent to a neighbor state where the estimated density is higher than the, what the, than the density of the state that it currently is. Um, this is a, equivalent to following the gradient of the density. Uh, and is equivalent to following the gradient for a number of steps enough for you to bring the agent to, to a state where the density of the computer density is high enough, enough to consider it to be back in distribution. So what the recovery policy needs to be is some form of gradient ascent on the estimated density to go back in distribution. Um, now, the problem is that computing naively the gradient of this density estimation doesn't result in a really viable action that the agent can take. Uh, for our case, because the states are images, the gradient would, would be into the, the format of an image, which is not really useful for a policy perspective. So now the problem becomes can we map this gradient, which is the optimal way that the agent needs to move to, into actions that the, the policy can take? Now, before I explain how to do that, I need to take a step back and introduce the, the concept of equivariance. I'm going to introduce the concept of equivariance from very machine learning perspective rather than a mathematical form that requires group theory and stuff that goes a bit beyond um, the scope of this presentation. So equivalence can be, can be formulated as uh, a formalization of symmetries, of symmetries of data. So taking a space S and a second space Z and a set of actions A that can act upon these spaces, um, how, how the action acts upon the space, of course, depends on the space and, and can be formulated through the definition of a transition function. So even though the action is the same, acting upon S or Z produces two different kinds of transition functions that I call here T and T prime. What these transition functions basically mean how the states of the particular space evolve when you apply the particular action. Um, and I wanna stress out that these are transition functions that map towards the same space. So the space is complete here. Um, now we can define a mapping E that goes from one space to the other. So from S to Z, such as the map that preserves this kind of formulation. So if this formula that you see in the bottom is true, we can say that E is equivalent with respect to the group actions A. What does this formula say? Well, it says that if you encode the states that results from the application of an action A to the state S, uh, 
should be the same as the, the state in Z that would result from encoding S directly and then applying A to Z rather than S. If this is true, then we can say that E is equivalent to respect to the group of actions A. So for this kind of work, we are interested on a particular kind of equivalence, which is called translational equivalence. And that's because the, the actions for us, as I said before, are Euclidean translations. So, so as I said before, the transition functions in the image space can be particularly complex and we don't have access to that. But because the actions are Euclidean translations, we can enforce the transition function in the learned Latin space Z to be simply translations into the Latin space. So Z plus A or E of S plus A. Um, and now what we want is we want a Latin space Z such that taking translations given by A into this Latin space results in, in the change in the image, in the very complex change in the image uh, that results from the agent moving with the same action. So what it means is that if you take two images, two subsequent images where the agent moved in the real world and you encode them into uh, this new Latin space Z, then these two encoded images should differ by exactly the same translations that they performed in the real world. Um, this very simple formula can, of course, be translated into a loss function. E can be parameterized by a neural network and can be learned by minimizing this supervised, uh, supervised loss function. And this is, this is a representation uh, of the images into a low dimensional, much easier and interpretable Latin space. Why is this useful? Well, because now we can, we can take this learned um, um, representation, this equivalent representation, and we can notice that now because translations are equivalent to the actions that the agent needs to take, now, instead of computing the gradient directly uh, on the data, of, on the training data, we can compute the density on the latent space of this equivariant encoding. And why is that? Well, because now, if you take the gradient with respect to Z, the gradient with respect to Z will be equivalent to the actions that the robot needs to take in order to move in that particular direction. And now the recovery policy very easily becomes simply the gradient with respect to our density estimation in Z. And could you please explain again? Yes. Why the uh, embedding is equivalent? This you mean? Yeah, how, how do you guarantee that the, the, there is an equivalence between the state space and the data space? Well, you guarantee it by minimizing this loss because this loss is just one global minimum. And the global minimum is for the one that um, uh, ensures that the first formula is correct. It's the only kind of minimum you could have for this, uh, for this formulation. Uh, because think about it, if you need to take a bunch of points or images and you need to lay them down into a Latin space, they cannot collapse to a single point because they need to be separated by A, which is non-zero, uh, but they can all, cannot also diverge because they need to be separated by, by this action, but they also need to be globally rearranged such that independently on which states you are, by moving by A, you would still end up into the resulting space. There is only one local minimum for this formula. So it's very, very easy to train, to train a model to, to ensure this. And what do you take for A? So A for us are the actions of the robots, uh, of the data set, of the offline data set that we've collected so far. They don't need to be optimal. They just need to be real actions that we want to encode into this Latin space. Make sense? Yeah, thanks. So, so yes, so sum up. So recovery is now the gradient of the density estimation with respect to, to the latent space Z. Uh, so now 
putting everything together, the model, the one, the model that uh, I've started with results into the formula for following formulation, where now the probability of being in distribution is a normalization of our density estimation. Uh, the learned policy, we don't really care. This uh, formulation is as general as possible. So this can be learned, as I said before, through any classical methods. And the recovery policy is a scaled version of this gradient. Scaled, if you want to be more conservative in the movements, doesn't really matter because as long as you move towards the correct direction, if you didn't move enough at the next state, you're still going to recompute to be out of distribution and still move into the, the same direction. Um, and this is done through the use of this learned, uh, learned equivalent, translational equivalent E. So this, yes. So in your case, the policies are continuous uh, moves right? yes. in the robot space. They can be continuous or discrete, um, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. As long as you can compute a density estimation and uh, as long as the gradient, I mean, makes sense. So for, con for a continuous formulation, the gradient always makes sense. For, um, for a discrete case, you would need to be careful on how you end up with because you move discreetly. But yes, but the formulation still holds. Because the recovery policy adds basically some magnitude to the learned policy in a different direction. Except, oh, yes, it applies the different actions. Yes. And in, in a discrete uh, space, how does this, this work? In a discrete. Not, not space, sorry, discrete action space uh, with discrete uh, actions. Well, in a discrete action space, doesn't really matter as long as the states are kind of continuous. Uh, because the gradient is computed on. Uh, uh, a Latin space of the of the of the space, right? Mm -hmm. um, in that case, you would need to modify the definition of your group actions a because now it's not translations, but is some kind of discrete function. Um, so, in general, equivariance can be defined upon any group, uh, but is um, the formulation above on how to learn it beca can become a bit more complex if the actions become non-trivial. So for example, rotations uh, or this kind of stuff or discrete actions, but it would still still hold. You would, you would need to tune a bit the, the loss function. Yep. Yes? So some uh, very brief experimental results uh, to try this. We've tried it on, on real robots to see if it was feasible into a real setting. Um, and what we did was uh, we used a um, kind of well-known robot for the research community, the, the Yumi. Um, we collected some semi-optimal trajectories with the teleoperated system using a, an Oculus Quest VR system that was connected to the robot. So a human could just move then the, the, the controller of the, of the VR and the robot would follow the same trajectory. Um, and while performing some tasks, we were recording some external images from a camera about how the robot was, was behaving. And we were as well recording the actions that the robot was taking. Uh, for these particular experiments, we assumed the actions to be um, velocities of the end effector, so of, of the gripper of the, of the robot. Um, and then to move the robot, we were converting this through an inverse kinematic model to uh, movements of the joints, of the motors of the, of the robotic arm. Um, and um, the goal of our experiments was very simple, was picking up this uh, small orange uh, cylinder and then drop it back into the yellow orange cylinder, which requires a bit of precision into the grasping because uh, the object is very light and it has a non-trivial shape, kind of a round shape, which doesn't really comply with the shape of, of the grip. Uh, and then it requires a careful insertion into the yellow bin. Uh, so it's it's easy to go out of distribution, as you saw in the first in the first video of the, of the presentation. And just to give you a bit of numbers, what we did was um, compare this this model 
with the baseline of a normal imitation learning policy. Uh, we, also, we also compared it with some uh, classical offline RL formulation, but we found that they generally require a lot more data than the imitation learning because it's more complex to train them. Um, and what we found out is that uh, in the case of the normal pick and drop task, adding the recovery increases by a lot um, the performances. But, but this recovery helps also in the case when the robot is forcefully brought out of the distribution by simulating an external force applied to the robot, which, which is not, not a rare case whenever you want to deploy a real robot in the real world. Uh, you need to assume to be robust to external, uh, uh, external factors. And in both cases, the recovery policies increases uh, by a lot the performances of the, of the overall model. So yes, so we, these were the experiments. And now just to sum it up, just some conclusions. So the original question that we wanted to answer was, can we extend the general formulation of learning a policy fully offline uh, with the second loss or a second policy that aims to bring the policy, the agent back in distribution whenever it steps outside of distribution, whether this was caused by some compounding error or some external factor, doesn't really matter. Um, and the proposed model um, um, relies on these three different points, estimating an indistri the distribution of the data sets. I wanna stress out here that this distribution can be computed with any density estimation technique. We relied on a very easy mixture of Gaussians because we want to prove that we don't really need a complex distribution uh, or a, a complex uh, estimation. And once you estimate this, you can recover from all these states by following the gradient of this density and following the gradient can be done through the use on F equivariant representation. Um, some often questions that I'm aiming to answer into future work probably is what happens if external objects that are needed in order to solve the policy go out of distribution? This, is, this increases the difficulty of this whole formulation as external objects are what they're called in the robotic commuter community underactuated. So you cannot really perform actions on the object, but you can perform actions on an agent then manipulating the object. So it's not that trivial to define equivalence in that case. Um, what happens if actions are more complex than translation, as John Luigi was asking, um, this can still be done, but it would require a more complex definition of the loss function into more general uh, group action space. And also what happens if the object moves during the trial, you would need some kind of adaptation of the density estimation, which can be done, but we didn't really explore in this, uh, in this work. And that's it. If you guys have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask. I have a question. I don't know if someone wants to can, ask online, but <clears throat> can you guys hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. From me, no questions, but thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask, first of all, how many modes do you use in the mixture of Gaussian? Doesn't really matter. So for the experiments that we did was 10 modes, but it doesn't really matter. The more modes you use, of course, the more precise estimation it is. But because we couple the, the recovery with the original policy, so we don't really go just uh, with the gradient of the density, but we also have a second model that really introduces a bias of the overall movements, doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of how precise you want to estimate to be out of distribution or not. But the overall movement would still make sense. OK. And if we can go back to the results uh, slide. Here. Yes. So the basic models are <clears throat> models trained with imitation learning without the recovery, right? Yes, and exactly. That uh, percentage there is the amount of <clears throat> times that they can uh, Su succeed the task in the task. Yeah. 
Okay. We we did uh, yes we we tried with uh, the manipulated object to be in two different positions and different conditions, um, and then we computed the accuracy of the model succeeding in the task. Which means we have two two metrics to to define a success, which is first being able to grasp it correctly, and then once it is grasped, to actually being able to drop it into the yellow bin, which is of course more difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the ones without recovery, they would just go out of distribution and then. Not always, that's the point. It doesn't really, so compounding error is, is not, it's not a, always a problem. It can be a problem. It depends on the initial conditions and external perturbation and so on. So that's why in some cases, imitation learning still succeed. Um, but we will robustify that and we are able to succeed also when the compounding error really kicks in and brings the, the, the agent uh, OD. Mm -hmm. And why is it that the perturbed pick and drop performs better than the standard pick and drop? Yes, so because the perturbed pick and drop was already kind of a difficult task for imitation learning, we've tried only into settings for which we knew that the, the robot was succeeding. Um, and that's why in the perturb pick and drop, at least the grasp for the imitation learning with recovery is 100%. Because we start from positions that we know that uh, it would solve. Otherwise, the performances were so low that didn't really make sense to show them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I think you need five more questions, but I think it's, it's good. Yeah, and um, maybe just the last one. <clears throat> when the when the recovery fails, what what is the fail do there? So the recovery fails uh, for a number of reasons. The most the most challenging thing is the is the contact point with the manipulated object, uh, which is a very well studied problem in robotics because the moment that the the gripper touches the object you have very non-trivial dynamics there. Everything can happen. The object can slip, it can be shot away, it can just drop. Um, and that's, that requires a level of sensibility, which is not always possible to get with this, uh, uh, with, with uh, learned methods like um, imitation learning or uh, computer vision methods. And, and the learning, uh, the scaling factor on the recovery uh, policy, how does that affect? Uh, eta, you mean? Yeah, that, that eta there. Yes. What effect does it have then in the experiments? And that's the other point. So eta makes basically the recovery be slower in case you don't really want to uh, have sudden movements in robots, which you always want to avoid. Um, so, of course, eta can be a very low number, and the lowest it is, the smoother the movement is. It's like a learning rate in uh, in deep learning, right? But you don't want the model to be too slow, right? So you you can tune this this eta uh, in this in this sense. Yeah. Okay. Also, another thing that maybe maybe I can add is that one of the advantages of using a Gaussian mixer model is that um, you have a very defined shape of the density uh, and you are subject to not a lot of, of local minima or, or local maximas. So in that case, eta can be very low because you don't have really a problem of getting stuck into local minimas. Okay. Yeah, cool. Any more questions from, from the others? All right, then we can stop it. Thank you, Fredo. It was a very nice presentation. And Thank you. Yeah. All right. This is the point. Okay. How do, how do we do this? Um,